Enlightenment is easy. It's the recognition that existence, right now, is the miracle of all miracles. We could be astonished right now, just like we could be oblivious, and everything in between. The problem is that we're unable to really grasp that, or experience that, and the solution is to get us to. We do that by connecting to the infinite, the real infinite, the one that includes all the others, beyond our numbers and symbols. It includes everything, including us, right now. We are that real infinity unfolding. That's what this is. That's why this is. We are here because of that infinity. We are always that infinity unfolding. That's all that's ever been happening. When we recognize the significance of that, we become enlightened. I'll begin by defining enlightenment, then discuss its importance, then the stages of enlightenment, what it's like, then I'll talk about the title Enlightenment 2.0, followed by a discussion of mindfulness, and finally I'll finish by talking about it in relation to society. The word enlightenment means to remove dimness or blindness, to give insight. It comes from two root words, in or into, and lighten, meaning shed light upon, illuminate, make bright. So together it's into illumination. So we can see that enlightenment is not necessarily religious dogma. It's more like 18th century European age of reason or age of enlightenment. In particular, we're talking about it in relation to reality and existence. Enlightenment is the practical discovery of our real circumstance right now. The experience allows for true understanding, for finding purpose in life, for awe and wonder. It's evidenced by humility and compassion for ourselves and for others. Enlightenment is very real. It's obvious, in fact, but easily overlooked. What makes enlightenment different from nearly everything else is how real it is. It's sobering, like death. It's real beyond all imagination. Enlightenment is simply experiencing the infinite, and this experience is profound and meaningful. But the experience is temporary, though. Due to our own consciousness and that of society, and by its very nature, the real infinity cannot become finite in a permanent sense. Why it's important. Enlightenment is the profound, clear, and authentic recognition that we exist right now. It puts us in direct contact with the infinite, where we realize everything where the experience alone makes sense without any explanation. Enlightenment is a connection to the infinite, but not just the numerical infinite, but the infinite that includes everything, including us right now. What we learn is that we are okay, that we are home. We learn about the profound and experience awe. What seemed like ordinary life dull and simple, turns out to be infinitely complex and miraculous. We learn that we're always safe. It's just energy and vibrations, moving about, transferring from one state to another, in cycles and rhythms and patterns, and frequencies. We learn about the complexity of reality and the conundrum of existence. We learn about the paradox that everything matters and nothing matters, all at the same time. All meaning comes from the infinite, where we finally have an authentic foundation. We immediately have humility and deep compassion for ourselves and others, because when we descend from this consciousness, we won't see this obvious reality anymore. We'll continue about our normal lives metaphorically stumbling around, causing each other to suffer more. The Stages of Enlightenment 
Enlightenment is not one thing. It's better thought of as a spectrum. The spectrum is as deep as infinity and as shallow as the finite. The experiences occur in stages, beginning with our first experience, followed by repeated experiences that become deeper. Almost everybody has already had enlightened experiences, if at no other point than just when we were young. It's almost inevitable. We just haven't had the appropriate intellectual apparatus to understand or interpret it. Then comes the experience and the recognition of it in the moment. One must learn to consciously bring it about, then bring it about again and again until it becomes a habit. Then one is in the position to make sense of it and of ordinary life. Then comes the ability to maneuver from ordinary reality to an enlightened state with greater and greater ease. From this stage onwards, enlightenment appears as an exponential curve to us. One can seemingly leap forward by orders of magnitude with almost no effort. In fact, the realization takes on a life of its own, where all of a sudden you're happy that you're able to return to an ordinary consciousness, because otherwise it would become too much. It's too clear. It's too real. Therefore, enlightenment is always a temporary experience. This is due to our own consciousness, our mental structure, and also due to our environments. Our common consciousness and normal society prevents sustained enlightened experiences. So the experience will eventually pass away and we'll have to come to terms with that. The long-term goal is to eventually make it a regular habit, like exercise, to create a foundation, one based on reason that is structurally sound. The goal is to be able to have that experience at almost any time. As we have these experiences, we are building the scaffolding around these states of consciousness and are constructing a map of reality. We are building a map for our own consciousness Reality during enlightenment. Now let's discuss what reality appears like from an enlightened state. The first thing one notices is how real everything is. In fact, the word real takes on a much more profound meaning than it did before. All of a sudden, it actually feels like it has meaning. One also realizes, without any explanation, that we are okay. And this is both relaxing and reassuring. We realize that nothing matters. But beyond that, we realize the opposite, that everything matters. That every single thing that happens matters because everything is related to everything else and it all affects each other to some degree. One can do anything or do nothing. This becomes obvious without any explanation. We don't choose this. It's what is. This is both beautiful and energizing. Beautiful because, in an indescribable sense, everything exists here all at once. All of space, all of time, every event and every non-event. Which means that nothing is truly lost. It's all preserved, including everything you've ever loved. It's energizing because while nothing matters on the grand scale, everything matters at the same time. Every single thing that happens has an effect, like a ripple in a pond that expands outward or a butterfly flapping its wings on the other side of the world and causes a tsunami. Finally, one also feels deep compassion and humility. Strangely enough, this gives substance and meaning to life. It evokes appreciation and gratitude for our lives and the possibilities before us. Compassion is first felt for oneself because we realize that we cause most of our own suffering and we can't stop and we don't want to stop. And what's more is that we're unable to make ourselves want to stop. This is our true circumstance, and it's not a trivial matter. 
then we have compassion for others. Because like us, everyone else cannot stop causing their own suffering as well. They are lost in the storm, just like us. Clinging to anything and everything, philosophy, religion, society, other people, etc., etc., all with little hope for refuge. What's worse is that in order to relieve our own suffering, we usually hurt others in the process. This is just the state of the world that we've woken up to. Unbridled nature is not fun. We live in an animalistic world where life survives by killing. Nearly every animal that has ever lived died by being eaten by another animal. And when we're not hungry, we fight each other. We cannot stop harming ourselves and therefore can't stop harming others. And we're locked in this vicious cycle. Finally, we have compassion for everyone because we are collectively creating our misery and suffering. We are a part of that nature and we have yet to be able to stop it. Humility is therefore the ultimate sign of an enlightened state. Enlightenment is our safe harbor from the storm, like mindfulness. We use them to recharge our batteries so that we can go back out into the world and help relieve the suffering of others. Now let's turn to Enlightenment 2.0. Why 2.0? For several reasons. The first is the technological reason. 2.0 refers to an all-new version based on the previous iteration, but different by an order of magnitude. For the first time in history, humanity has the capacity to consciously chart its own evolution. For the past thousands of years, enlightenment has been obscured and cloaked in all sorts of dogma and ideology. This time, enlightenment is for everybody. It's not reserved for certain people like gurus or monks. It doesn't require religious dogma, rather just a rational signpost pointing in the right direction. 2.0 also refers to this particular period in history where a 2.0 and a 3.0 can occur and are occurring rapidly, even exponentially. All the pieces are now aligned. Mindfulness and enlightenment are the keys that unlock modern education, science, technology, connectivity, and society. We can each develop a mind that is clear and light and ready to take on the larger challenges. Another reason for Enlightenment 2.0 is that the time has come for a global enlightenment. It's the new goal of humanity for our species. All people can become enlightened and the world needs a global enlightenment. If we are to survive this adolescent period of civilization, it must come quickly because our world will not survive the coming hurdles of the mass extinction of animals and plants on land and in the oceans, mass deforestation, overpopulation, overconsumption of diminishing resources, major diseases, climate change, and the list goes on and on. It's time for each individual to become enlightened and to work towards the enlightenment of others. Now let's take a look at how mindfulness and enlightenment relate to each other. Now that I've discussed what enlightenment is, the value, the stages, etc., let's turn to how to have an enlightened experience. There are many ways to bring about the experience, but I will only focus on one of them, or rather the first stage. Mindfulness is the practice of looking deeply. It's a very rational approach to connecting to the infinite. At first, it's best to have guided sessions. Then after you become thoroughly familiar with the various techniques and terrain, you can guide yourself beyond that. Please see my version of guided mindfulness titled A Brief Tour of Reality. Here, I will only describe mindfulness. The real value comes from doing it, not thinking or talking about it. A good place to start with mindfulness is a metaphor, 
because it will connect the description of mindfulness to the experience. It's like the difference between a calm puddle of water and one that is disturbed by wind and rain and dirt. The wind and rain and dirt make it difficult to see through. The water is cloudy and the surface is disturbed by the ripples, which makes everything seem distorted. Compare that with a puddle where the sediment has sunk to the bottom, where the ripples have calmed, where the water is clear. One can see through it all the way to the bottom. There's no longer ambiguity. Reality seems obvious and rational. And the previous distortions are now comprehensible. Now we are at a state where we can make some real progress. In this analogy, the distorted reality of the murky pond and disturbed surface is our everyday mind and common society. It's not bad, rather just too narrow and small compared to the large context and broader reality. The clear and see-through water afterwards is the broader reality, where we see our connection to the infinite at that moment. Our everyday consciousness, which seems ordinary, simple, and boring, suddenly becomes far more complex. It becomes clear that our consciousness is constantly changing, along with our moods, and we don't even recognize these shifts. For example, we have different consciousness when we're asleep and awake at 7 a.m. versus 3 p.m., when we're calm versus when we're rushed, when we're happy versus when we're angry, when we're alone versus with others, when we're with strangers versus longtime friends. The foods we eat change our consciousness, just like caffeine and alcohol or entheogens. And this happens on a mass scale where society is the sum total of this, and that's rarely noticed. Mindfulness is calming down the erratic mind and focusing our consciousness on the more accurate and authentic reality for short periods of time. A successful mindfulness session makes the broader reality perfectly clear. Mindfulness is the session, and enlightenment is the result of a successful session. The mechanism that causes the shift is the relatively sudden change in consciousness, and especially actually noticing it while it's happening. The sudden change in consciousness is brought about by focusing the mind in such a way that the larger world becomes clear, and then we're able to receive this new experience. In this position, one can see both sides of reality, this new one and the old one, and that makes all the difference. Most of the time, we don't focus our minds in this way, although it happens on occasion uh, in music, painting, dancing, exercise, etc. But even if it does, we rarely recognize it or the significance of it. I'd like to end this with a look at how all this relates to society. The first thing to notice about society is that it is the collective version of us, of the same normal and ordinary yet narrow reality that each of us has most of the time. Society, like most of us, has not been lucky enough to wake up to itself. Since society is the collective version of us and our everyday reality is so limited, society is also severely limited. Therefore, be weary of getting too entangled with its many facets, like obsessing with how you look, what money can buy, what other people think of you. The root word of culture is cult, so be cautious. Obviously, you have to interact, so how you do this is by minimizing the negative and maximizing the positive. Minimizing the negative includes realizing that your time is extremely valuable, that life is precious. So do things that matter to you, not what matters to other people. Stop spending time on things that don't align with your principles. 
television, for example, is almost always unenlightened and pushing principles that contradict enlightened ones. The primary purpose is to make profit. That means that all decisions flow through that variable and almost anything competing with profit loses. Maximize the positive. Find an enlightened community. A community is indispensable for succeeding at anything, and this is only magnified with an enlightened community. The new goal for every individual and the entire globe is enlightenment. We need that to save ourselves. We need that to save the world. Unfortunately, we as a society have not built a very good support structure for enlightenment. It's not noticed or appreciated or sought after. But that is where we come in. Our society is at a point never witnessed before in all of civilization. We have all the tools to become enlightened ourselves as a society and eventually the whole world. And this is needed on so many levels. So we have the ability and the need we just need to carry it out, and we do this one by one. I'll end with this. Enlightenment is not about becoming perfect or escaping. It's about realizing the broader reality and context, and then redirecting our time and energy towards making our highest hopes and ideals become reality. If you enjoyed this episode of Enlightened Society, please subscribe, share, and donate. Thank you.